Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 42, I chat with Nelson Pass about his illustrious career in audio and do-it-yourself amps and speakers. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded November 15, 2010, episode 42, DIY Geek Fest. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off the lifetime of your new account, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code HTG. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here with ultimateavmag.com and hometheatermag.com. My guest geek this week is Nelson Pass, founder of Pass Labs and DIY Guru. Hey Nelson, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks very much. My pleasure. I'm really glad to have you on. I've known your name for many, many years and... Um, so it's a great pleasure to speak with you, and uh, hopefully we will get some questions from the chat room. As always, I invite those of you who are tuned into the live video stream at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv to post questions for Nelson, and I will pass on along as many as I can. Um, so Nelson, let's start with how you got started in amp and speaker design. Well, I, it was a classic case of teenager who uh, has a mother who owned hi-fi and listened to a lot of music, and I grew up that way. Now, and your, about the your, time, mother was, your mother was the hi-fi geek in your house, in, not your father? It, it, well, yeah, actually. I mean, he, uh, he involved kind of himself in <laughs> getting acquiring the equipment, but she was the one who did most of the listening. And so there was a there was a fine record collection, and I uh, spent a lot of time with it. About the time that I was 16 or so, I pretty much had the bug, and I needed my own equipment. Uh, but I didn't have any money, so I you know started cobbling things together out of pieces and such. Um, and by the time I hit college i was found myself hanging out with people who uh, were far more sophisticated in these matters and uh, some of them were designing gear and um, well that's what happens when you hang out with people like that you get involved in stuff and uh, there it was it just took off from there and ultimately uh, became a uh, career yes now uh, i believe in your bio it talks about uh started you starting um uh, designing or working on on DIY projects while you were in college uh, and also while you were working at ESS which was a speaker company in the 70s I believe well as I say I fell in with a crowd of people who were doing this already uh, specifically there was a guy named Peter Wareback who was designing his own amplifiers and he had a roommate that who was a friend of mine he uh, got a job at ESS which at that time was a startup and uh, he was designing amplifiers for them. And um, I ended up in 1972 getting a job there also, only I didn't design amplifiers. I designed crossovers, built prototypes for speakers and uh, in general R&D. I arrived a week before Oscar Heil did, so I got to see it, all the excitement from the ground floor. Wow, the the Heil motion transformer, I believe it's called, uh, was a, a revolution in tweeter design, wasn't it? I think so, yes. And as I recall, that was based on a ribbon type uh, tra uh, transducer technology. Well, it was a ribbon kind of arrangement, but what it was was a a folded ribbon. Uh, that worked in such a way as to gain more leverage over the uh, acoustic characteristic of air. 
it's one thing to push air uh, with a with a flat diaphragm because uh, you have a situation where the air is going to, uh, for all intents and purposes, move at the same velocity as the diaphragm. If you fold the ribbon and make it operate a little bit more like an accordion so as to squeeze air, you can make the air travel faster than the motion of the diaphragm itself. You can impart a lot more energy to the air and it, uh, it not only makes it a lot more efficient, uh, but it, uh, it makes it a little faster too within certain limits. The, the upshot being is, is that it was... Um, Definitely an advance in tweeter design, and of course it made put uh, made ESS very successful, put them on the map, and uh, <laughs> consequently gave me a lot of experience in the industry and how things go. And I was there for uh, a year and a half designing uh, speakers, crossovers, and so on for mm -hmm. Heil Air Motion transformers. Mm. Is that is that transformer the Heil Air Motion transformer still being used at all by anyone today? You can still buy them new, as a matter of fact. Uh, oh, is ESS still in business? I didn't realize that. ESS is apparently still in business. They are, uh, I think, well, they're, right now they're located in Southern California, if I'm not mistaken. So that hmm. uh, production had gone off to Europe for a period of time. and uh, But earlier this year, I got a call from the people in Southern California saying, here we are, we're back in the U.S., we're making speakers, and uh, there it is. Huh. What do you know? Now, after ESS, I believe you went on to co-found a company called Threshold. Well, I was at ESS for nearly two years, and during that time, as I say, I was designing speaker stuff, but at the same time, I had gotten the bug for building my own amplifiers, and I person who's associated with ESS, Renee Besne, who is actually their marketing director and was in charge of advertising, artwork, a lot of industrial design, and so on. Uh, he and I were close friends, and we decided that <laughs> this is one of those, if these guys can do it, I guess anybody can. So we <laughs> launched, we launched uh, uh, Threshold in uh, 1975, and uh, Spent about a year developing the first product and uh, subsequently launched what became the uh, 800A, which was the first version of an amplifier that used dynamic bias to uh, get a little higher efficiency out of a Class A amplifier. Now, was that a tube-based amp or a, a, a solid state? That was solid state. Mm -hmm. uh, is Class A often implemented with solid state i've more often heard about that being used with tube based amps well class a is uh functional with either uh type of device and uh it just simply is the least efficient way that you can <laughs> amplify <laughs> audio but it's also the most linear way and so uh people have to often make a choice are you going to have something that is either low power uh, or is are you going to put up with something that puts out a tremendous amount of heat in comparison to the energy that it's going to put at a loudspeaker? Typical efficiencies of a Class A amplifier are down around 30% uh, or so, sometimes less, sometimes a little more. The more conventional Class A, B type amplifiers that you play with are, you know, in excess of 50%. And of course, class D is getting up into the 80 to 90% region. Mm -hmm. So you, you pay a penalty for class A. It's, uh, it's the one in which the output transistors are always conducting in the linear region. This is, this is also true of tubes or, uh, well, I guess there are no other gain devices. <laughs> but, but the Tubes or transistors, is, yeah. <laughs> transistors, pretty much it. Uh, so, and, so, and as I recall, Class A uh, basically uses one set of amplifying devices, be they tubes or transistors, to amplify the entire waveform, both as it swings into the positive region and as it swings into the negative region. Compared with Class B or Class AB, with some uh, variation there, uh, where one set of devices amplifies the positive swings, and the other set of and another set of devices amplifies the negative swings. Have I got that right? That's pretty much it. There's also single-ended class A in which you have essentially one 
amplifying device, which is, is necessarily going to be class A because there's no opportunity to operate in what's thought of as push-pull. In push-pull, you've got a positive half to an output stage and a negative half, and it's kind of a relay race where one half of it does, does work in the positive region for a while, and then it's time to switch off to the negative half. And if you envision it as a relay race, what you've got is the, the sound, the signal, it could be thought of as the baton, and uh, they have to uh, share that baton. Somebody does a lap, hands over the baton. The key for performance when you're doing that sort of thing is, uh, is a question of how well the baton is transferred. If you look at a real relay race, what you've got is the person who's going to get the baton begins running before the handoff, and so there is a period of time where both halves, both runners, as it were, are doing, are, are working and sharing the, the signal and the load. And that results in a very smooth transition. And, and you can imagine, by contrast, a, a situation where the runner simply stops dead, hands over the baton, and then <laughs> the other guy begins running. That's known as Class B. <clears throat> and there's a reason why Class B isn't very popular, is because of that discontinuity. Hmm. So class it, A is uh, class A B is when both runners are running for a little while as the baton is passed. Right in class A, both runners are holding the baton all the time, <laughs> and it works very well, but it's very inefficient. Um, I've got a question from the chat room here uh, asking if you've heard of class T digital amplifiers and what you think of them. Uh, class T is perhaps the tripath uh, digital amplifiers. I don't know if that's the specific reference, mm -hmm. which yeah, I believe, if that's the case, we're, we're dealing with uh, a, a, a class T very a class D variation, which is uh, where the the T is actually probably a trade name for the product and for the mm -hmm. particular design. Uh, can you describe briefly uh, what a class D? amp is. Many people call this a digital amp, and I know that that's sometimes a misnomer. It is, in fact, uh, inaccurate. A, a class D amplifier is, um, is a switching amplifier. It's technically an analog device, uh, or, or even thought of as a, as a linear device, <laughs> although it's the most nonlinear way of, pretend, of pretending to, to accomplish this. In that, you have uh, a, 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 like, oh, almost like a class B amplifier, two halves, one positive, one negative. One is on, and then the other is on, but they switch back and forth very, very fast. And the signal output is actually uh, reflects the duration with which one side, the top half or the bottom half, is on, versus the duration of the other side. So, if the uh, in switching, if the on side of the, uh, if the positive side of the uh, class D output stage is on longer than the negative side, then you have a net positive, and it's switched at such a fast rate that. Uh, you can filter those frequencies out that are that are the actual sampling rate, and what's left over is a low frequency that we we would refer to as the audio. Hmm. Okay. I'm getting a bunch of questions from the chat room, which I really appreciate. Um, <clears throat> uh, F Loop asks: uh, Are integrated audio components from semiconductor manufacturers getting good enough for you? You keep assessing new integrated products for manufacturers. Or have you given up on them? Well, good enough is, is, is <laughs> Not the a relative context. term. <laughs> on the context, yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't have a problem with any of these things. Um, the the you know, since the course of the uh, '60s and '70s, as we as, as technology has progressed, uh, the overall average quality of equipment has gotten considerably better. It's a little bit like the California wine industry. If you go back to the 50s, the types of wine that you could get in California and the variations in quality were, were uh, not exceedingly good, and European wine would be what you'd want to normally be drinking. But the California wine industry invested a lot of money in the technology. I went to UC Davis, which is where I got a lot of this. And uh, in wine, fact, they wine central. 
they, they, they invested a lot at UC Davis and science came in, as it were, and raised the, the average level through technology of everything that you could uh, 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 make. And so when you go to the store now, you can buy a large variety of you know, wines and uh, you know, different levels of quality and cost, but they're all pretty good. They're all pretty drinkable. Audio is kind of along the same way. There is a, you know, on average, a, a tremendous improvement in the quality of at least the uh, electronic reproduction. And, uh, but there is still quite a bit of variety in terms of the, you know, high-end offerings, what's in, and, and, and the other thing is, is that everybody has different needs. Uh, we are looking at people who, um, are listening in their car. We're listening. We're talking about uh, people about who are, you know, uh, uh, hiking, or treadmilling, or yeah, listen, listening on some of the MP3 players and so on. Well, yeah, and, and the, the real point here is is that there's a wide range of equipment that meets different people's needs, and and, mm -hmm. and they all have very different needs. Yes, indeed. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about. Uh, I wanted to talk quite a bit today, actually, about DIY and your advocacy of do-it-yourself projects. And I know that we have a, a photo of your very first DIY amp, uh, which I guess it's the first one that you actually designed uh, as opposed to built from a kit or something. Here it is. Uh, tell us a bit about this. Well, uh, that is the first amplifier that I designed from scratch and built. It is also my first effort at what's thought of as a non-switching amplifier. I mentioned the 800A a little while ago, which was the successor to this design. Uh, this is an amplifier that it was a, a, a pretty good amplifier for its day, but what was unique about it was the output stage uh, pieces, uh, the transistors in the output stage, the positive and negative halves, never sh actually shut off. And so they, that was an improvement over the ones where, which, which do. Um, now, you, you call this a switching amp. Was it, is it a, a Class D amplifier? Well, when we're talking about push-pull amplifiers and the, and the classes, uh, in Class A, the, the output stage, the two halves never shut off whatsoever. But in a Class B or AB amplifier, when one of them is doing the work, the other one is actually shut off. And so the, the goal in this particular case was to keep them humming along without dissipating too much energy. And so um, you play some tricks with the curves so that the actual devices themselves are maintained in some sort of conducting state. There are specific uh, delays associated with turn on and turn off for transistors. And so while this isn't particularly Class A, it's, it's differentiated from what's been referred to as pure Class A. Uh, it nevertheless had improvement in that the transistors were at least hopped up and always ready to go. Ah, so they, had, they, they took less time to get running, as it, to, you, to go back to the runner uh, relay race analogy, to, yeah. uh, it took less time for them to get up and going because they were always, in a, in a sense, running. Yeah, even if they weren't running very much, they were at least standing. <laughs> <laughs> Jogging, shall we say? <laughs> yeah, that, that would be another way of putting it. Okay. Now, in addition to uh, amplifiers, which, which you have done many of yourself, uh, you also have been involved in DIY speaker projects. And I know we have a couple of pictures of those as well. Uh, the J-Lo, for example, <laughs> which... I, I imagine you probably named before Jennifer Lopez took on that name, right? Well, the reason it was called a J-Lo was is that um, it used a Jordan full-range driver, a little four-inch full-range driver, as the, uh, as the source of bottom end through top end. And if you look at it, it looks like the little, little button on the front there. And so quite a small driver, as you can probably see. And the whole point of having big back-loaded horns uh, behind, those, uh, behind those drivers is to amplify the rear wave off of the, uh, off the little speaker and give it enough uh, uh, horn expansion and amplification in the bottom end so that they could do bottom end as well as mid-range and as well as top end. Mm. They, they already did a fine job in the mid and top. What they needed was some help to go loud in the, uh, in the bottom.
and and the horns do that. So they J comes from the Jordans, and of course the low comes from the, the enclosure that gave them some significant bottom end. Gotcha. And no, Jennifer Lopez was already around. That was a pun. <laughs> <laughs> Now, a question in the chat room uh, is is something I actually was planning to ask. If we can put the picture back up, uh, you will see um, on the top of the equipment rack that stands between these two speakers um, are two boxes with a bunch of light bulbs on top of them. What's going on with those? Oh, well, those are the Zen lights. Um, a little bit of story is probably uh, uh, appropriate. One of the most popular series of DIY sets of projects that I've done is uh, is a series of amplifiers and this is for DIY called the Zen amplifiers and they were uh, are an ex exploration into how simple you can make a good sounding amplifier and of course in the end which a real goal for that would be well how good can we make it with only one transistor and the Zen is once again a small joke it comes from the the con which is what is the sound of one transistor clapping? <laughs> so <laughs> the Zen series, though, is very popular. And, and uh, the, one of the reasons for that is, is that these projects were sufficiently simple that a lot of people who were otherwise intimidated by big schematics and, and complexity in projects looked at that and said, you know, I probably could do that. And the Zen light is a, even, is a very simple circuit in which you can take a single transistor using no other semiconductors in the amplifier whatsoever. Uh, you do have to come up with a power supply and that inevitably is going to mean probably a rectifier bridge, but taking that out of the equation or imagining that you perhaps were driving this thing with batteries, which you could do. Uh, <laughs> the, the Zen amplifier was a single MOSFET that uh, was attached to light bulb that, or in this case, some parallel light bulbs uh, that act as the uh, the load and the bias circuit for that, and you uh, you had an amplifier. Uh, more recently, the um, there's a project that I posted at DIYAudio.com called the D light, which is a new type of depletion mode uh, JFET transistor. But I went back and dragged out the light bulbs again. And the light bulbs are very convenient. You could use a resistor to do that job, but you have to buy an expensive resistor and stick it on a heat sink. Or you can go down to the hardware store and get a 300 watt light bulb and a socket for about, well, the socket will cost you less than a dollar. <laughs> Plug it in and, and you're done. And of So course, the light bulb it, uh, is, act, is performing the same job as the resistor in this it circuit. Is, it, it's being used as a resistor. It just happens that it gives you the benefit of glowing nicely and looks great at night. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, but the great part was is that uh, these things are very doable. Anybody can go get a light bulb, and if you feel even most marginally competent with, uh, with regards to handling that kind of stuff, you can build an amplifier, and that's... That's really the that's really the cool thing about particularly audio DIY is is that you can uh, get in and play, and you can get uh, satisfaction uh, for you know initially for not a lot of effort, and so you, you tend to get hooked with it because mm -hmm. uh, it's doable. Right, uh, and you had four light bulbs on that. Oh well, let me ask you this: I forgot. Um, what was the power output of that? Uh, of that Zen, uh, the uh, initial uh, version on that was uh, I don't know seven eight watts, not very much. Not very much. The, jo the Jordan is a pretty efficient speaker, and you horn load it, and it's even more efficient. It, four or five watts is was perfectly adequate to drive that system, which hmm. is another thing that's kind of interesting. DIY tends to bring this out also, and that is is that. Loudspeakers, for the most part, are unnecessarily, uh, unnecessarily inefficient. Um, in the old days, when you were running tubes, and you know, you, you tubes were expensive, and you know, they also consumed a large amount of power and ran hot. Uh, a big amplifier was 30, 40 watts. Um, a really big amp was 70 watts, and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of loudspeakers were designed around that. When you look in the 50s and 60s. And of course, even before that, it was even worse. 
Uh, there, there was an age in which loudspeakers were particularly efficient and uh, amplifiers didn't have a tremendous amount of power. Uh, if you go back and listen to this stuff at, at, at this late date, it tends to be very good. Uh, I have some fine examples here. Uh, mm -hmm. We at Pass Labs keep Altex, Tannoys. I've got a nice new set of JBL L300s that I, that I got recently. Um, when you look at a lot of the speakers that are involved, that you, that you run across in DIY stuff, uh, some of them are extremely efficient. We, we're talking 95, maybe more than 100 dB on a watt. So most of the stuff I play with if for DIY is, is drivable with uh, 5 to 10 watts without any problems at all. Now, a uh, question in the chat room from X-Ranger uh, says, back in the day, low-efficiency speakers were all the rage. Now high-efficiency speakers are the norm. What are the trade-offs? Is, is, he, is he correct that low-efficiency speakers were the norm back in the day? Well, uh... I don't know how far but you have to go back. <laughs> uh, if you go back far enough, high efficiency was really it because you didn't have that much power to work with. Now, when you start looking at the advent of higher power amplifiers in the late 60s, when you could start, when you could buy a Dynaco 60 watt per channel amplifier for not very much money or a Harman Kardon Citation 12, again, about 60 watts. And then people like you know, our friend Bob Carver, who you interviewed, came along and started offering 400 watts. ESS came out with an amplifier that was uh, maybe 300 watts a channel. And new transistors, new hardware uh, in, from the late 60s and early 70s made it possible to uh, develop really high power without uh, a tremendous amount of uh, resources being spent. And so loudspeaker manufacturers found themselves uh, you know, with a, a wealth of power to work with. The they, had the, uh, they had the power and the consumer had the, the wattage. They began making trade-offs uh, to use that power to their advantage. And so less efficient speakers became uh, the norm after, uh, after a matter of short number of years and uh, the advantage was first off uh, the uh, boxes were made smaller and so it became <laughs> the wife acceptance factor for hi-fi uh, became a lot easier to achieve because the uh, things like the audio the, the acoustic research AR3 and other uh, uh, designs which had relatively heavy woofers could get deep bottom end or relatively deep bottom end without a large enclosure so suddenly bookshelf speakers were uh, available that had you know some bass mm. and uh, this also coincides with the advent of uh, uh, the popularity of rock and roll and the Beatles and everybody else so people wanted that bass and uh, it all fell together but in a very real sense the industry kind of took a left turn there is uh, still very much a, 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 a orientation of how many watts. I mean, most of the market still deals in terms of how many watts. If you're an auto sound, it absolutely is how many watts. The, <clears throat> the, the efficient speaker and low power amplifier crowd is a subset of the high-end audio industry. And, and when I say high-end audio, I'm thinking two-channel home audio is distinguished from car sound as distinguished from you know pro sound as distinguished from home theater sound mm -hmm. so uh, the tweaks out there who are doing DIY a lot of them really appreciate high efficiency speakers they they like the sound of that stuff and uh, it also of course is easier to build amplifiers of low power in in my case I specialize in low power largely because First off, they're charming amplifiers. You can do a lot of things with a simple amplifier if you're not constrained by having to make it extremely large and extremely powerful. And uh, But if, in fact, it has a fairly easy job to do, you can concentrate on the sound of the amplifier itself instead of a lot of other issues. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it makes it a lot easier to build if you're a DIYer. But the other thing is, is that there is a sonic characteristic to high efficiency drivers, horn drivers, uh, some, you know, some of the full range drivers like the Lowther's and such, um, 
that are uh, very appealing to a good segment of the uh, audiophile population. And um, I, 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 I personally find them very interesting. And as I say, I, I tend to work with them uh, as, in, the, in, the, in the hobby sense. Mm -hmm. um, got a question from the chat room. How do you assess the impact of your DIY involvement on your commercial business? Does it take away from uh, your, your business or does it increase your cred among audiophiles? Well, it does increase my cred among audio, among audio files. <laughs> um, we get huge numbers of hits at our web page, and a lot of that is associated with the DIY activities that we have. Mm -hmm. At D, uh, uh, DIYaudio.com, where I basically have my DIY nest for uh, public consumption, um, we get a tremendous amount of traffic. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's a, a large number of people registered there. There's a large number of people who just go there without registering. And um, in a, oh, a good example is uh, the DIY thread on the F5 amplifier, which is, the, I'm sure you'll bring up First Watt, but is a, is the, is a product that First Watt, which is my little company, uh, developed. and published the plans in such a manner that people could build their own. Mm. Uh, that thread's at a million and a half hits at this, no, I'm sorry, it's 1.3 million hits at this point. Mm -hmm. And and we find that, you know, we're, we have millions of hits at the websites uh, with both First Watt and uh, Pass Labs, and it's an enormous amount of traffic when you, when you consider that. This is largely DIY. Um, so there, there is a. It does put your name out there. There's a lot more recognition, uh, you know, name recognition as a result, mm -hmm. and there's a considerable amount of goodwill. That's one positive thing about that. The other is, of course, is that uh, well, we're doing good. We're we're contributing to something that I think is a uh, an important effort. It's an important effort on a lot of fronts. First off, is is that. Um, it doesn't get as much support from the industry as it probably deserves in considering that uh, uh, a lot of these people are people who uh, frequented or, or dealt with uh, retail establishments back when there was more support for two channel before they got involved in home theater and suddenly found that they weren't as interested in the hi-fi guy who used to come around. Mm -hmm. A lot of that has gone over to the net. The other thing about it is, is that, you know, you know what kind of life we have at this point. We're, <laughs> people are expected to be more and more consumers uh, than, uh, than anything else. And uh, things are structured so that it's tougher and tougher to be a part of the, uh, of the things in your daily life. You buy a television set, you don't have much of a chance to open it up and fool with it. People uh, don't get to work on their cars the way they used to. Certainly, I, I wouldn't ever make such an effort. And so, um, and and people's jobs similarly are, um, uh, I don't know how to put it, you know, cubicalized in some way or other. Mm -hmm. There's there's a lot of that, and there and people need uh, uh, some form of creative outlet, uh, and will find it. And, and very often, uh, DIY audio is just about ideal because almost everybody loves music. And uh, like I said, if they if they give it a shot, they'll probably get the bug. <laughs> now, uh, part of that que that last question was: Do you keep any? Do you reserve anything? Do you have any secret sauce in Pass Lab products, uh, for example, that uh, you wouldn't share with the public, with the DIY community? I should say. Well, inevitably, it all gets shared. But there is such a thing as timing, and so uh, very often, so this stuff bleeds out a bit at a time. Currently, uh, at both Pass Labs and in First Watt, uh, there are some uh, uh, trade secrets that are involved, which we keep to ourselves because we do need to occasionally sell amplifiers, and we can't be giving it all away. Uh, but. We, the but but mostly it just comes down to lead time. Uh, if, if the, the projects at First Watt, for example, were always uh, set up as limited duration, 
And uh, so while I put the information out there in general so that DIYers could begin thinking about it and many of them could begin developing the circuits on their own, in other words, leave enough breadcrumbs and hints and information that the, the brighter of them begin assembling these products for themselves anyways, uh, which by the way is all to the good, uh, the, the, the key thing that we have to avoid is simply putting ourselves in a position where uh, people, uh, manufacturers simply begin offering the products, or in the case of DIY, the boards and the kits, uh, in such a manner that it, uh, it kills the sales of commercial product. So we find that it's just simply uh, the, the best way of dealing with that is to put some uh, uh, the time space between the introduction of commercial product and then releasing more technical details with regards to it later. Mm -hmm. at, at this time, I have a couple of products out in, at first watt, the M2 and the J2, which I've essentially published all every, everything that everybody would actually need to know to put those together, and there are people building them. However, there is no uh, official schematic, and I've discovered that the cloners usually wait until they can get a hold of an official schematic, one that's actually signed that says, this is it, folks, before they will uh, uh, go and invest on their own to produce boards and try to get them sold and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's kind of a fine line. Uh, but that said, we aren't doing anything so wild or dramatic that, for instance, our, our actual commercial competition couldn't simply buy the amplifier and go, oh, yeah, that's what they're doing. There's, there's not, much in the, in the, uh, not much means for prevent, pre preventing that. But having said that, there's not much actual need. The competition all has their own designs and you're usually too busy bad mouthing your stuff to copy it. So it's really <laughs> not not that I don't find that to be a problem. The the cloners are, are, are kind of a uh, kind of an annoyance. But it's not nearly the problem that people imagine. Um Part of it is just showmanship too. I mean, if yeah, on a, in the case of DIY stuff, if I just splat it all out right away, uh, people don't get nearly as much entertainment out of it as they as they will if you uh, time it out properly. Right, right. Well, I, I've got several questions in the chat room about first watt, and that was certainly something I wanted to spend a considerable amount of time on here. But before we do. I wanted to take a moment to thank my sponsor for this episode, Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high-quality website or blog. Squarespace.com has an easy-to-use UI uh, for creating and managing your website or blog. Uh, it's optimized for both beginners and experts, and there are hundreds of design templates to choose from, and you can customize any of them to fit your needs. The all-inclusive service includes several modules, to build your website, such as blog modules, a forum, form builder, Flickr photo display, something I would use, uh, Twitter widget, Google Maps, and more. Uh, there's website tracking and a built-in search engine optimizer, and permission access handling, cloud architecture for speed and site stability, an innovative drag-and-drop Ajax interface, even an iPhone app to uh, manage and access your website from wherever you are. Use Squarespace for all your website needs, Build it, post it, update it any time. For a tree for a free trial, go to squarespace.com and sign up for a free account. There's no credit card needed. Just try it out and build your own website. Then if you decide to purchase, use the offer code HTG and get 10% off the lifetime of your new account. That's squarespace.com and use the offer code HTG. So getting back to uh, Nelson Pass, we've, we've been covering a lot of DIY ground, and uh, <clears throat> I've gotten several questions in the chat room about First Watt. And I wanted to ask first about the name First Watt. We were talking earlier about low power amplifiers, and uh, I suspect that is partly where that name comes from. Well, there's a couple of things going on. First Watt is my little kitchen table company. 
it started literally was kitchen table company, but at this late date, it's it's expanded to take up all of the old shop space that used to hold past labs, which I started here at my house, but which some years ago I moved up into town into a real building. Um, First Watt is an opportunity for me to not only kind of marry the DIY stuff to uh, anything that I might want to be working on at any given time, but it also gives me a playground in which to do what I want without creating trouble for past lad, which is the operation that pays the rent. Mm. And so uh, what I have done is I have put uh, kind of an artificial barrier between the two, which uh, is, is the wattage of the amplifiers themselves are low wattage necessarily, and, it, and that puts, uh, the, puts a differentiation between past labs products and what we do. They start at 25 watts. I pretty much end at 25 watts. <laughs> that said, 25 watts for me, and for most of what I do, is plenty. And uh, the name first watt, comes from a, a, a famous saying by Dick Ulsher, who's one of my favorite audio critics. And his statement was, uh, the fr well, there, there are a couple ways of putting it. The, the first watt is the most important watt. And the other way it's been put is, who cares what an amplifier sounds like at 1,000 watts if it sounds like crap at one watt? Yeah, right. The emphasis, though, is, is really what, it, what is the sound at those low levels? A lot of commercial products that you see, amplifiers that, uh, you know, have, have enjoyed some kind of success. When you look at the specs on them, there's an emphasis on the distortion at high power levels. Uh, it's, you know, it's 0.01% at 1,000 watts. Mm. Many of these uh, amplifiers, and there's there's... This has changed over the years, but if we go back a little bit, many and most of the amplifiers in the early days had decent specs at high wattage levels, but uh, you found that the performance declined as the level went down. The distortion went up at lower levels and, and did so in almost a straight line. That seems counterintuitive to me. Um, I would think that if the amp is working very hard at the upper end of its capability, it would exhibit more distortion than if it were coasting along just producing an amp, a watt or two. Well, you'd think, but these were amps that were designed for high power, and so the emphasis is there. And the other end of it is, is that these were class B and class AB amplifiers, where you again had the two halves of an output stage playing relay races, and the nonlinear area where the uh, batons were being uh, traded off is down at the low uh, at down at the lower uh, levels that's and true the the failure of these things to be as linear at low levels was a function of that of what's known as crossover distortion and uh, class a fixes that very nicely but uh, a 400 watt per channel class a amplifier is a wonder to behold <laughs> so uh and, and and a lot of it was market driven. You know, the, the the advertising, the promotion, the demand on the part of consumers was high watts, high distortion. I'm sorry, high watts at low distortion. At low distortion, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't that much focus on on the on the quality at the lower levels. And it, but you know, the whole thing, the whole enterprise has become more sophisticated and, and matured to the point where a lot of these things are well understood. There are a lot of high quality amplifiers, A B amplifiers that still are doing quite well at the lower levels. First Watt is simply a uh, is simply a company that places the emphasis on the lower levels, and if you want lots of power, you you simply go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, like, what like that to buys us, for example, for example. <laughs> but, but what the low wattage buys this is the ability to build very simple amplifiers, uh, very linear amplifiers, and even though they are not highly efficient amplifiers, they are not they're not going to dissipate tremendous amounts of energy and uh, be particularly unecological. Um, so there's there's a lot of advantage to uh, operating in the small domain if if the consumer 
has uh, systems uh, that are uh, rel this has a loudspeaker system that's relatively efficient. You know, he can uh, get what he wants on just a few watts, mm -hmm. and without a lot of money, he can get a very fine amplifier. Yeah. Now I've been getting some questions in the chat room about uh, your. Um, semiconductor devices that you're using in some of these amps, and it was something I was going to ask you about anyway. Um, uh, the particularly the SIT S I T, and uh, F Loop in the chat room says uh, that amplifier designers often uh, are often stuck with components created and produced for other industries, um, and for whom linearity is a second secondary design consideration. Uh, can you discuss this and maybe apply it to what you're doing with your SI, with the new SIT transistor, which is some sort of super JFET, if I'm not mistaken? It's a it's a variety of JFET, but but I should probably J, give by you the some way, JFET stands for junction junk, FET. junction FET, uh, junction ju field effect transistor. Correct. Uh, background on this, of course, in the old days there were just simply tubes. And there were uh, different tubes available for different applications. And uh, occasionally even uh, uh, tubes were designed with audio in mind. But for the most part, <laughs> the industry doesn't design with audio in mind because audio is a very small percentage of their, of their sales applications. Mm -hmm. um, there are exceptions to that, but pretty much that that's the case. So uh, most designers take what they can get and uh, and and make the best of it, and that that's often been the case. Uh, after tubes, we had bipolar transistors, uh, which have increased in quality over the years. They started out being fairly crappy, and, but like I say, nowadays you can get some very fine bipolar devices. In the uh, late 60s, JFETs, had, the, the quantum mechanics uh, had come along far enough to be able to realize uh, a, a JFET, which is a, a field effect transistor, looks like a tube in many ways. Uh, most Look, specifically, you mean, what, what do you like mean, looks like or performs like? It has a character. Oh, uh, yeah, well, of course, it performs like. Uh, the characteristic curves of, of a device like that, and I'm sure you're going to show that curve of the SIT at some point or other, but there, there's, a, there's a plot of performance uh, of the various voltages and currents for all these devices, and mm -hmm. they, they fall into families. Well, there we go. That's, that's an SIT, which I'll, I'll come to. But you look at the graph, and you've got a vertical of amperage, you've got a horizontal of uh, voltage, and then you step the control input voltages, and you get a family of lines, and then and that's the characteristic set of curves. Triodes look like that. Uh, pentodes. Tri triodes are a type of tube or transistor are, that behave uh, in a, yeah. a triode-like manner, right? They are. They are in fact a tube. Uh, the uh, there's the and pentodes, the other variety of tube, which have a, a different characteristic. And uh, but but the point here is is that. Uh, all these game devices have a family of curves. They're all kind of different, and some are more desirable for some applications than others. But the JFET was developed uh, as a practical part uh, in the late 60s, but it was always pretty low power, very high quality, uh, kind of tube-like, pentatube-like, uh, but low power, low voltage, and used usually for input stages and such. Uh, I began working with MOSFETs, which were metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors, which were kind of like JFETs, but they, they were a little different. However, the industry managed to produce those as high voltage, high current, high power devices. And so around about the late 80s, uh, I pretty much switched my flag from um, bipolar transistors to MOSFETs. Uh, and part of that was is that they, in many ways, are simpler to work with. You can build simpler circuits that function well. They perform well with high bias, class A conditions, and um, they're a little more tube-like. They, they also are, look like uh, pentodes. Uh, and I have been working with JFETs and, uh, and MOSFETs since. But power JFETs, which are really, in, in many ways, the most ideal sort of part, 
uh, up until recently had really not uh, been available as power parts. In the mid-70s, Yamaha and Sony uh, in, in Japan had developed uh, actual examples of power uh, JFETs called VFETs is, is what they were called. V as in? Uh, v as in actually meant V for vertical structure. Vertical. Okay. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, it gets confusing quickly because, for instance, almost all the MOSFETs that I play with are vertical structure also. And so VFET is no longer really used. It's, a, it's become a misnomer because of that. <clears throat> um, but, uh, but, those, but the Sony and the Yamaha parts were relatively short-lived. Fundamentally, the market wasn't ready for them is what I think. And uh, so MOSFETs came to dominate, and, and I've been working with them, as I say, since the, the late 80s, and uh, when I started past labs and had opportunity to be really clean sheet about my designs, I moved uh, straight over to MOSFETs exclusively for power transistors and pretty much JFETs for lower power transistors, and I, and I just find them to be the devices which um, sound the best. Mm -hmm. But they also allow me to build very simple circuits that perform well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, power so JFETs... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, how does that get us to, to SITs? Ah, well, power JFETs still became <laughs> one of those things were very attractive, but they didn't exist. <laughs> uh, a few years ago, though, and this is one of the reasons I love DIY, is, is that I get a lot of information back from everybody as well as imparting it to them. And so it's really a two-way street. Uh, one of the DIYers informed me uh, that, in fact, uh, he had located some power JFETs made by an outfit called Level Tech. And, of course, I buzzed straight over to their site, found out what the story was, and uh, bought what ended up being half of the world's supply. Yeah. And developed an amplifier for it that uh, was uh, extremely tube-like. It was the first watt F3, a little 15-watt amplifier, single-ended class A. And um, a really rather marvelous amplifier. And that whetted my taste, as you can imagine, for power JFETs, but unfortunately these particular ones were quite low voltage, quite low power, and so uh, they needed to be put in rather special circuits in order to get the performance out of them. What I was looking for ultimately is power JFETs where they are high voltage, high power, high current, just like the MOSFETs that I already had. And another DIYer subsequently, about two years ago, clued me into a company called SemiSouth, which it turns out are making power JFETs out of silicon carbide, which is a new material that can be operated at very much higher temperatures. It has different, uh, you know, uh, electronic characteristics than silicon. And I contacted them and began playing with some of the parts that they already had. And these are power JFETs, junction FETs. When I use them in amplifiers, I get lower distortion. Very <laughs> straightforward proposition. They work mm -hmm. a lot like MOSFETs in, in many of the ways that are important, and that's convenient because you can drop them into different types of simple designs. But when you looked at their characteristic, the bandwidth was better, the distortion was lower, and the price was about 20 times higher. <laughs> uh, that's not a problem. I don't mind spending 20 times higher tra in, a, in a transistor. Usually transistors themselves are a lower part of the actual cost of a product. This is an industry in which people will spend you know, anywhere from $10,000 to $100,000 on their hi-fi. So uh, $50 for a part for a transistor, which can make a tremendous amount of difference in the context of all that, is, is not exorbitantly expensive. Tubes cost that much. Yeah. So, so I've been playing with these JFETs. I came out with another amplifier called the J2, which used these power JFETs, which I'm still selling and have been very successful, uh, uh, now particularly in Asia, where I think that there's a, a strong appreciation of these sorts of things. Very, very simple, high-performance circuit. And... Um, I was having a nice conversation with a uh, head of engineering development at uh, Semi-South one day, and he goes, you know, we had uh, uh, a contract once upon a time 
I think this was one of those government contracts for uh, some static induction transistors. And uh, we, it had been noted at the time, one of our guys remarked that these would be ideal audio trans transistors. And, uh, you know, we thought maybe you could be interested in that. We don't have any samples, but we know how to make them. And, and apparently they had done a run of parts uh, for what appears to be military contractors some years ago who showed up, scooped up all the dye and went away. These are radar parts. And it turns out also that uh, <laughs> our government isn't the, only, isn't the only outfit that has developed some kind of an interest in this stuff. Uh, the, uh, the Russians have also been developing these kinds of parts and putting them in radar. And, uh, and, and the Japanese also had made some. These, these actually had, or, had originated in Japan. And they're called static induction transistors. They are JFETs, but they have a particular structure to them so that instead of looking like a pentode in that characteristic curve, they look like a triode. But that wasn't the goal with regards to the design for, for, for why these things were developed for radar. It, it had a lot more to do with um, the tremendous bandwidth that they could manage, and especially when fabricated out of silicon carbide, they also have tremendous um, dissipation capabilities. And so that's a, that's a great interest to the military, as you can imagine. A lot of the, all of these JFETs were by SemiSouth had been developed for high power switching, radar usage, uh, solar cells, electric cars. Where absolute in the case of the energy case, uh, the energy industry, extracting that last ounce of efficiency out of the uh, the switcher that has to convert, say, solar cell power to something that you want to use. Every little percentage point means a lot over the over the life of a product. It's worth a lot of money to have something that does that even a tiny bit more efficiently. And um, these are all parts, none of them developed with audio in mind, but which happen to function very well uh, just uh, as a coincidence for, for audio purposes. As a and in that regard... Well, it was a byproduct, and, but, but it really comes down, just down to low distortion intrinsically. So are we going to see some uh, products from First Watt that, uh, that use these SITs? Well, I'll finish the story. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> so they, 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 uh, they, gave me, uh, they made me an offer to finance uh, development and production of a single run of these devices. But they were scaled down from radar usage, which is extremely high voltage, uh, much lower current, and so on, uh, to the kinds of uh, voltages and currents and impedances that would be of interest to a loudspeaker. And in this particular case, the devices intrinsically act as if they want to be looking at a, a load between 4 and about 16 ohms. And, and the characteristic is, is virtually ideal in, in that regard. And um, so that was about a year ago, and it uh, it it cost a fortune. <laughs> it was a bit of a gamble, but I ended up with a uh, with some boxes of parts, and they are in fact uh, uh, appear to be all that has been promised. And right now we're in the process of putting them into prototype circuits, evaluating the objective performance, and then sitting down and spending actual time listening to them under various conditions to see what it is we, we really have. Because listening is the end result, uh, or the, the, the last test, maybe even the first test that we, we have involved in. And sure. uh, objective measurement is basically is used to inform our subjective uh, conclusions. Sure. Well, um, unfortunately, we've run out of time, and I'm really sorry about that because there's a lot more we could be talking about. <laughs> I, I can go on for a very long time. It's true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, will you come back and be a guest again sometime? I think we'll probably do that. Yes, I'd like to. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you. Nelson Pass of Pass Labs and First Watt uh, for a wonderful conversation. Really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Good, good. Uh, you can find out more about uh, Nelson's work at passlabs.com uh, or firstwatt.com. And he mentioned also his website, diyaudio.com, where you can find out a lot of stuff about building your own electronics, amplifiers in particular. Um, 
and PassDIY.com. My online homes are UltimateAVMag.com and HomeTheaterMag.com. And you can email me at Scott at Twit.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at HTGeekScott. Next, week, next week's episode will be a little different than usual. I'll be talking with my colleague Tom Norton about basic setup tips for your home theater. So get your questions ready. We're going to be taking a lot of questions and also talking about how to set up your display and your speakers and your receiver and so on. So uh, I think it's going to be a very valuable hour that I sure hope you will tune in for. Until then, geek out. Geek out.